would like to share a message with you today that deals with four fatherly responsibilities, seeing it is Father's Day. Now, I typically do not allow national holidays or the Hallmark Company to dictate what I speak about, but I thought I would focus on fathers because, well, I've not delivered a Father's Day message for over 11 years. And while this message focuses on fathers, it has application for all who hear. In this pandemic era, much of our attention has been focused on staying safe and staying healthy. It's focused on jobs or lack of jobs, on homeschooling for those with school-aged children, on working at home, and a, and a multitude of other things. And while all those things are important, I want to share these four responsibilities with fathers because they also are very, very important. And as I continue, I hope you'll come to the same conclusion. Today's scripture comes from the last chapter of the book of Joshua. And after living out a very, very exciting life of faith, Joshua's about to die. But before he's ushered into eternity future, he gathers people before him one last time. He summons the leaders of the people, such as the tribal heads and their judges and their officers. And then once gathered, Joshua proceeds to declare the word of the Lord. And he begins by taking a brief stroll down memory lane, recalling God's interaction with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He reminds the people of how God dealt graciously with Moses and how Israel was delivered from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And he recalls how God led people through the wilderness to the River Jordan and how after they crossed the river, God delivered Jericho into their hands. In addition, God delivered the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites and the Jebusites into their hands. Joshua reminded the people that God gave them land which they had not labored, cities which they had not built, vineyards and olive groves which they did not plant. And then we come to our text. In light of all God's provision and protection, Joshua says this. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worship beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. These two verses contain four important responsibilities that I want each and every father to be aware of this Father's Day. And not only do I want fathers to be aware of them, I want fathers to believe them. And I want them to believe not just with their head, but also with their heart. Because these principles must be written on the tablets of their hearts as evidence by living out these principles. Otherwise, what is received today will be nothing more than a bunch of words that will be forgotten within the next few days. When you believe something, it changes your life. Or there's not really belief. There's just a reception of information. What you hear from God today must be assimilated and lived out. So are we ready? The first responsibility deals with remembering. And this is such an essential resp responsibility, not only for fathers, but for anyone. Why? Well, it's essential because we easily forget many, many things. However, if there's one thing that we should not forget, it's the blessings of God. You see, forgetting causes us to take things or people or even God for granted. The psalmist declared, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Psalm 77 verses 11 and 12. 
seems to be a standing joke that the older we get, the more we forget. And while there's a good deal of validity in that belief, there are many reasons why our memories don't work like we would like them to work. I mean, you have to work at remembering. Now, because the internet makes more information available to us today than at any other time in history, you can find many different ways to improve your memory. So I have no desire to discuss them with you. But I do want to mention one that I think is extremely significant. See, remembering, remembering something requires concentration. And to concentrate means that you direct your attention to someone or something. When someone remembers, they may be recalling some kind of information that's been stored away in memory. For example, I remember a crane uh, lifting pieces of steel structure into place as our east wing was being constructed. I mean, it was pretty exciting to watch. Remembering can also mean keeping something in mind for attention or for consideration. And I think that's how the psalmist uses the word. He may recall past deeds of the Lord or past miracles. However, he doesn't recall them just to indulge in them as if they're just something wonderful to remember. He recalls them so that he can keep them fresh in his mind. He remembers them so that he can focus his attention on them in the present. He wants to meditate on them, verse 12. He wants to consider them and their implications. Now, don't get hung up on trying to figure out what the differences are between deeds and miracles and works or mighty works or mighty deeds. This is Hebrew poetry. And Hebrew poetry includes parallelism. Verses 11 and 12 are basically saying the same thing using different words. In verse 11, he remembers. In verse 12, he meditates. What does he meditate on? Well, he's meditating on what he remembers. And his remembering causes him to meditate. In verse 11, he talks about deeds and miracles of God. In verse 12, he refers to deeds as works, while referring to miracles as mighty deeds. Some of what he remembered and meditated on most certainly would have had to do with Israel's deliverance from Egypt, with the plagues, with the parting of the Red Sea and with their wilderness journey. What comes to mind when you think about God? Can you remember any of his mighty deeds? I mean, you may need to concentrate on this question. How about his work in creation? How about his plan to redeem a people for himself? Think about how he worked out his plan in your life. Think about how he is conforming you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Think about how he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Concentrate on how he has blessed you in other ways, how he has blessed your family and so on. Think about what lies in store for you when Jesus returns again. Meditating on these sorts of things cannot help but affect how you live and how you think and how you speak and how you raise your family. These are things that you should pass on to your children. You pass them on not only so that they may know, but they may see that they are important to you and that they've made an impact in your life. Because children learn so many things but what they observe in us, don't they? Perhaps you might want to start a journal so that you can record those deeds and mighty works of God when they happen. I mean, that'll make it much easier to remember. It's like looking at a picture of your children when they were very little, and then that photo triggers memories of those past times. A journal can do the same. As you look back, you'll be amazed at the great amount of blessings that God pours into your life. Write them down so that you can remember and pass them on to your children and your children's children. I mean, this is an inheritance we can all give our children. The second responsibility deals with fear. Joshua commanded the people, now fear the Lord. And as is 
important as it was for Israel, it is just as important for us today. It's important for fathers to fear the Lord, especially when society tells us to be fearless. I hope you've come to a place in your lives where you recognize that the meanings of words are extremely important because many words have multiple meanings. I grew up in a generation where the word cool was a reference to something that was agreeable. If your baseball team won a ball game, it was cool. If you received a high grade on a test, it was cool. A generation or two before me would have understood cool to mean something that lacked warmth, something that was on the cold rather than on the warm side. Word meanings are important. And there are a number of meanings for the word fear in the Bible. Some meanings focus on concern. Some meanings focus on dread or terror. Some focus on carefulness. And some have to do with reverence, such as the meaning of fear in Joshua 24, 14. In this verse, fear includes having a healthy reverence for God and for God's infinite power. And this reverence encapsulates a sense of awe and esteem and value and respect and wonder of his majesty. This principle is closely tied to the previous principle of remembrance. Look at all God has done for his people. Look at all he is still doing. Think about what lies in store for us in the future. What other God is like our God? And the answer is none. I mean, our God is all-powerful. Our God is all-knowing. Our God is infinite. Our God is transcendent. Our God is loving and merciful. Our God is also righteous and holy, and therefore he must punish sin. As such, in this regard, fear would also include dread and terror, for as the author of Hebrews stated, it's, it's a, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Hebrews 10, 31. There should be a healthy terror when it comes to offending him. And even though we're his children who no longer stand in condemnation because we're in Christ, that doesn't mean we'll not be disciplined when needed. I recall some of the times when my father had to correct me as a child and I know this may be hard to believe, but I have not always been the perfect person you see before you today. In general, Mom left the corporal punishment duties up to my father. Living in a large city, we didn't have a woodshed, but we did have a basement. And when it came time for my father to administer the board of correction to my seat of knowledge, down the stairs we would march. And Dad would go into his workshop and He'd select a stick that he would normally use to tie up tomato plants, somewhere maybe about a half inch square piece of wood, maybe three feet long in length. Back in those days, parents didn't use a timeout method to discipline. A good swat on the fanny usually produced the desired result. And so after Dad made his selection, he spoke those dreaded words, bend over. And I would slowly assume the position while trying to keep an eye on Dad to see when that swat was coming so I might be able to brace myself for impact. And most of the time I, I didn't have an opportunity to brace for discipline was swift. Now because some may feel this method of discipline is cruel or abusing, let me quickly point out that my father was never cruel and abusive when he disciplined us. In fact, I am sure I did not receive what I really deserved. I would have loved to have received a timeout rather than a swat or two on my backside. But that's not how things were done back then. My parents disciplined me when needed because they loved me, because they wanted the best for me. And so the best way to avoid a swat was not to do something or say something that would result in such discipline. Likewise, God's word tells us in Hebrews 12, 6, 
For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Why? He has our best interests at heart. Fathers, your children, your family, your friends need a man who will fear the Lord. A man who will stand in awe of the majesty of God, who esteems and who values and who respects God for who he is. A man who, out of reverence, avoids things that may result in discipline. It is you who should pattern what it is to fear the Lord. A third responsibility that I want to share deals with service. Again, this principle easily builds on the previous two. When you remember what great things God has done or is doing and is yet to do, when you have a healthy fear of the Lord that motivates you to love God and hate sin, you are then free to move to a place of service. This may seem like a simple principle to apply, but it's not. Because life presents many, many distractions. The flesh presents many, many distractions. And if those two are not enough, then the devil gets into the game and, and does the same. His involvement is clearly illustrated for us in Matthew 4. Following his baptism, Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And there the adversary would tempt him in all manners of temptation. Jesus is in a very vulnerable state physically. I mean, he's been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Then the tempter comes to Jesus, and he appeals to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. And while the flesh may have been weak, Jesus' spirit was not. At each attack, Jesus deflects the enemy's deceptive words with scripture. And then finally, Jesus says to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Matthew 4.10 Fathers, it's your responsibility to teach your family what it is to be a slave or a bondservant of Jesus Christ. To become a bondservant of Jesus Christ, one must be freed from the bondage of sin. In other words, you must point your children to Christ. As far as it's possible on your part, you must lead them to Christ. Leading them to salvation is the most important thing that you can do for them because such decisions have eternal implications. In his letter to the saints at Rome, Paul wrote, Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness, Romans 6.16. This tells me you can be a slave to one of two things. You can be a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Romans 6, verses 17 through 18. Fathers, entrust to your children the plan of salvation, for it will lead to holiness and life everlasting. Romans 6, 22 tells us, But now that you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. Just as Joshua stated, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord, so must this be your battle cry. You must declare it, you must live it, and you must guide your family to do the same. You see, everyone serves someone. It doesn't matter if you're a believer, it doesn't matter if you're an atheist, everyone serves someone or something. As believers in Jesus, God must be the one whom we serve. If we're citizens of the kingdom of God, if Jesus is our Savior and Lord of that kingdom, we are his servants. And it's him whom we must serve. 
not anyone or anything. This is important because far too often people confuse service with serve us. Some expect God to serve them. He becomes their spiritual genie who is responsible for granting every wish. Some within the body of Christ expect others to serve them even though they themselves will not do what they expect others to do for them. But this doesn't mean that that has to be your expectation. And by the way, notice how we are to serve God according to Joshua 24, 14. We are to serve him with all faithfulness. God expects us to be faithful servants. Just as God is faithful, so must we be faithful as well. So make it your view, your expectation, your goal. That as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And pass that on to your children. The fourth and final responsibility deals with the removal of all idols. Joshua commanded the people, Throw away the gods your forefathers worship beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. You see, you can't serve God and something or someone else. Jesus said, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. Luke eleven seventeen. In our day and age, no one thinks much about the term idol, unless it's a reference to the show American Idol. But in biblical times, idols were things that either represented some kind of deity or something worthy of reverence and worship. Often they were carved images, or they were images fashioned out of precious metals like gold or silver. You know, in some parts of the world, such idol worship is still taking place. But in our Western world, particularly in our country, idol worship seems to take on a different type of form. They may not be fashioned out of carved wood or fashioned out of precious metals such as gold or silver. Still, there are things that people worship things to which they devote their lives. So in the simplest of terms, an idol is anything that takes away your focus or your love or your affection from God. So idols can be people. Idols can be inanimate things. Idolatry is a heart issue. It's an affection and a love issue. Idolatry is not just the worship of a statue or some other religious symbol. It's that to which you are devoted. And so it's a treasure issue. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21. What do you treasure? There's a, there's a movie that Annette and I enjoy watching entitled Leap Year. And I won't bore you with the plot, but in the movie Declan, the individual hired to drive the main female character, Anna, to Dublin, asks her this question. He said, if your house was on fire and you only had 60 seconds, what would you grab? Well, the question clearly has to do with material things, right? I mean, in other words, what one thing is most important to you? In light of Jesus' statement in Matthew 6, 21, we can ask ourselves, what one treasure is most important to me? How would you answer that question? Life is filled with many pursuits, isn't it? I mean, we go to work, we raise families, we buy houses, cars, and other material items. We recreate, we entertain, we teach our children oftentimes to pursue these very same things. And we busy ourselves with many, many things. But if we had to have everything taken away except for one thing, what would that treasure be? I would hope that for each and every follower of Jesus Christ, the answer would be my relationship with Jesus Christ. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you recall the first two commandments in the list of ten found in Exodus 20, deal with God and idols. 
God's people, Israel, are told that they're to have no other God but him. In addition, they were not to make or fashion any idol which they would bow down and worship. Why? Well, worship and devotion must be directed to the one true God. If you, if the things that, that you treasure most is your relationship with Jesus Christ, that treasure will affect every area of your life. It will affect your work. It will affect how you raise your family. It will affect the things that you purchase, how you recreate, how you choose entertainment. It will affect relationships both within your family and outside your family. However, if it is not where your heart is, then all these things become idols. Where is your heart? The body of David Livingston was buried in England where he was born. But his heart was buried in the Africa that he loved. And at the foot of a tall tree in a small African village, the natives dug a hole and placed in it the heart of this man whom they loved and respected. Listen, if your heart were to be buried in a place that you love most during life, where would it be? These four principles are valuable for each and every one of us. But as I mentioned in the beginning of this message, because today is Father's Day, I especially want every father who is listening to this message to realize the importance of these responsibilities, to live them out in their lives, and to pass them on to their children and their children's children and their great-grandchildren. Will you remember? Will you fear? Will you serve? Will you put away idols? Make your decision today. And then go about your life.